Well, welcome everyone to our Raging Aging Pop-Up Symposium for the month of uh, September. Today, um, we are going to be having a, a workshop and presentation on um, equity and transportation and how do we get there. Um, it's presented by Bob Dallas. And let me just uh, introduce myself real quick. I'm Jim Kelly. I'm the program manager for the 55 plus driver safety program out of Georgia's Department of Public Health Injury Prevention uh, uh, Division. And uh, we cover all programs here to make it driving a little bit safer for those folks who are 55 years and over. And for those of you that are going to be 55 plus and over at some point in the future. Um, and everything that we do will be working towards that. Um, you've all received invitations to other uh, pop-up workshops, and I hope you take advantage of them. If you couldn't, just send me an email, and when we get a um, location that we can host our recordings, we shall do that and allow them to uh, be seen by anyone who couldn't make it. So please. Um, I'd also like to introduce my co-host, uh, Lila Ralston. Uh, if you'd like to, Lila, if you'd like to do a quick introduction for yourself. Sure, if I can get myself unmuted. Hi, I'm Lila Ralston. I'm the program consultant for the 55 plus driver safety program and uh, glad to be here. So let me introduce our speaker today, Bob Dallas. Bob is a civil lawyer with extensive experience in developing and implementing public health and safety behavioral programs. Bob's business and legal background serve as the foundation for his numerous leadership roles in both non-governmental and governmental organizations. With over 30 years in public health, 25 years as a planning commissioner, and eight years as director of the Georgia Governor's Office of Highway Safety, Bob has focused on aligning disparate interests in transportation, public safety, public health, and land use to achieve public behavior changes that improve health and safety outcomes. Bob is a founder of Safe Kids of Georgia and currently serves on the Vision Zero Network Board and Road Safe America Board. So let me say, Bob, it's all yours. Thank you, Jim and Lila, and thank all of you who are on this call. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you some thoughts. And, and when I say share, really, it's a, it's a two-way communication about equity in transportation. So my first step, of course, is to share my screen. And hopefully, you all can see the screen okay? Thumbs up, I hope. All right. So um, let me go ahead and uh, move down. So the first question that you need to ask is, well, actually there are two questions. Bob, what are you doing talking about equity and transportation? And let me begin by first saying, you ought to first ask this question, why are you wearing red and black? I mean, aren't those Georgia colors? And if you don't know my background, um, I am a graduate, undergraduate and graduate school from University of Florida, so big gator. My spouse, Liz, is a two degree earner from Georgia Tech. So uh, she's a big fan of that. And we certainly had something in common to cheer for or against uh, when it came to playing another team that typically wears red and black. And so if we go down to that, of course, that's the uh, University of Georgia. Life uh, is, imposes ironies on all of us. So our eldest and second eldest son are now sophomores and freshmen at the University of Georgia. So as parents, uh, Liz and I certainly have to reconsider our relationship with University of Georgia from being uh, antagonist to protagonist when it comes to their playing any kind of sport game. Unless, of course, we're talking about their playing our respective teams, but we're supporters now of um, University of Georgia. So it just kind of shares this idea that despite your or any of our uh, long held beliefs, there, there is a future for reaching out to those that uh, perhaps uh, on the playing field, at least uh, you were uh, opponents. Uh, the second question is, I'm an imperfect um, messenger on the term of equity. And I think that's really important to understand because in some respects, uh, when we talk about equity, all of us um, are um, imperfect because we're biased, right? We come to the table with our thoughts, what we know, and there are many things out there that we don't know. And so 
in many respects, I, like so many others, uh, have to uh, consider the idea that our perception and perspective of things is unique in one sense, but not the only thing, obviously, in the other sense. And so with that, keeping those two points in mind, which I'll get to at the end, uh, even more so, I think it's in, you know, for those of us on this, uh, this um, presentation, just keep in mind that, you know, long held ideas sometimes can and should change. And, you know, in some respects, it's okay that we're biased because when we acknowledge that, perhaps then we can learn more later. Transportation and equity. Obviously, it's a very big issue, and this is an issue that's come up over the past several years in so many different ways. And, you know, we talk about equity in different arenas, but I think probably more so in transportation, it really does jump to the forefront. And one of the things that I started observing as uh, organizations and people were discussing about equity in, in transportation is that people had different meanings of what they meant by equity. So one group or person was saying equity in this context another was saying it in another context. And so it was like, what context is the term being used so that I can better understand what's being said and you know, try to work with uh, organizations and people to achieve uh, common goals, which for many of us on this call is highway safety. And so um, with that, I also came to the realization that sometimes what I'm thinking about what equity means may not be what the person speaking about equity means. So with that, um, the question came up, all right, how are we going to find out what equity is and transportation? And so like so many things, we begin with the beginning, which is uh, the uh, Webster's uh, uh, dictionary, which this is a 1951 version uh, definition. And as you can see there that the definitions are pretty short. And, you know, the one that in context of what we're talking about, um, justice according to natural law or right, freedom from bias or favoritism. It doesn't say much more than that. When we look at, for example, what um, the federal government has talked about with respect to equity, their definition is really long. And to the credit of the federal DOT, a couple of months ago, they put out a request for information about how equity should be used in transportation. And, and so putting that out into the federal register, they had a very long definition of it. And it covered the spectrum, but it also made it hard to understand in what context the term was being used. So my hope is as they uh, accumulate a whole lot of information from a whole lot of organizations and people, uh, the federal DOT will also be able to more precisely identify and define equity in the context for which it's being used. Um, another one it is a group that I have a lot of respect for. In fact, I think they're having their national conference right now as we speak. Uh, and that's Governor's Highway Safety Association. And if you're familiar with them, every highway safety office in the uh, states and territories in DC belong to the GHSA. And they really work with closely with Congress and National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration to address policy issues. But when you look at uh, their role in the behavioral side of things, they have a very strong relationship as does NHTSA with the law enforcement community, which is one context where equity does um, uh, come in uh, a lot. And so that, that's a good place to, to look. Uh, another is the organization that I serve on the uh, national board, and that has to do with Vision Zero Network. And really, we look at equity uh, first and foremost. And when we look at it, 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 it's very situational in many respects with certain principles. And that is to look at where needs are the greatest, engage in the community, which is a, a theme that I'll constantly referred to throughout this presentation and take time to examine the role of enforcement because we do see that enforcement is so commonly relied upon. And in that reliance, we've seen a lot of questions being raised as to how it's being used pretty much anywhere in the United States. So another really important um, here, here, I'm sorry, I meant to get to this right. This is the other part of where we in uh, Vision Zero look at uh, the law enforcement component and, you know, just, just really trying to focus in on how can we do better with improving traffic safety without having such a reliance on the law enforcement community. And for a Vision Zero perspective, a lot of it has to do with developing the infrastructure, engaging the community and making those investments where in the past, 
the funding wasn't um, invested, and secondly, where the data says it should go. So this is just a further discussion of what Vision Zero has on um, its website, but we spent a lot of time in developing these different points. So one, one thing that's very important to understand in uh, equity, because we can look to the past and you know see things that by, I think any person's definition would say that's inequitable. And I'll give you the easiest, probably biggest example that many cities throughout the country uh, have experienced. As we know, the Eisenhower interstate system was commissioned in 1956. And the idea was to connect uh, the entire United States by limited access roadways that would allow anybody to be basically within an hour of an access point to that system. And as part of that, a lot of the interstates went through downtown areas and the decision was where should they be built? Well, a lot of times that decision was based on the financial side, which says, oh, we're gonna put the interstate system through those parts of town, which are basically less expensive, in other words, low income. They tended to be substantially more impactful to the uh, communities of color, African-American communities, splitting them in half, and really forming a foundation for communities that were perhaps once thriving to not being thriving for a very long period of time. But that's an example of uh, equitable decisions uh, being made in the past when equity really wasn't part of the conversation. Um, but should equity address the future? How do we do that? And you know, should it just be the rearview mirror look where we just fix the past or have things changed when we look to invest in what we should be building and things that we're doing? What are the standards that we look at to address those? And you know, I submit to you that it does take a very hard look at what was done in the past, but it takes even a more clear look as to how should, things should be done in the future and done in a different way than we did in the past. Because I submit to you, many of the decisions in the past were made in silos without a whole lot of community engagement. And you know the consequences of that were uh, not the kind of things that collectively helped the entire community affected but probably benefited one more than the other over the many years that we've had to address this in um, uh, transportation. So with that, you get kind of this perspective of differing definitions of equity, how um, the past looked with equitable decisions, how should the future look? And so what it comes down to is right now, the questions are a heck of a lot more than the answers. But you know what? Any of the folks that are involved in academia know that asking the right questions is really the most important things because if you do, then you can get to those right answers. So for us in uh, transportation safety, uh, we at Emory, and I say we because I co-chair the transportation safety task team at uh, IPRICE, which is the Injury Prevention Research Center at Emory, we started talking about the term equity and how it was being used in transportation safety, especially. And, you know, recognize that as I illustrated before, there's just so many different definitions. So as all good research institutions do, they have two things to their benefit. One, uh, they put together kind of like a, a, a methodical way to assess what equity is in the environment that it's being used in uh, the transportation field. And two, um, you know, it also um, has a, a great asset known as grad students who are really smart and uh, can help out. And so, um, what we decided to do was uh, ask this question, how are governmental and NGOs using and applying equity? And it's basically it was a scan to ask the question of how, how are others using the term or are they using it at all? And so with that, um, and this is a link to the uh, website where the draft of the uh, study is published. Uh, we did ask the question of how equity is being used for both governmental and NGOs. And Dr. Jonathan Roop is the director and the graduate students that were really uh, great at helping us with this was Gor were Gordon Lee and Alicia Violet. And as you can imagine, a lot of tedious work, either making phone calls or getting on websites, trying to divine how organizations use the term equity. And um, with that, they um, um, th that, that's the question that we asked, by the way, defining transportation equity an environmental scan of organizations and how they define and achieve equity in transportation. So getting to the point of how are others talking about it? And um, like many things, uh, it broke down into four different areas. And um, this presentation, as I understand it, will be made available to you all as part of this recording. Um, the 
uh, first thing is accessibility. In other words, how is transportation transit uh, available to different demographics of people? And there are a lot of organizations that spend all of their time looking at, at accessibility. Because if you've heard of you know, people living either in food deserts or not being able to get to their job because of the inability to afford a vehicle or the transit system just doesn't work for them. Secondly, affordability, big issue. And it was interesting during the pandemic, we saw many of the transit agencies throughout the country basically dispense with collecting any fares, both by uh, virtue of receiving uh, CARES dollars, as well as by virtue of not wanting to have to closely transact with people for fear of uh, transmitting COVID. But um, affordability has remained a big barrier to a lot of people being able to access the transportation systems at all. And we've seen that um, shift become more pronounced both during the uh, pandemic, but also before that, when we started seeing demographic shifts of um, gentrification in the core areas of cities and the change in some of the suburban areas with lower income, when you consider a suburban area, it tends to be very car dependent, but if your income doesn't support cars basically for everybody, then how does that work in terms of uh, things? Safety, something that I've spent a lot of time with, and that is, how do we ensure that our systems are safe? And you know, when we get into that conversation, that's in, in great part where the behavioral side comes in, where we're asking law enforcement to enforce how we use the transportation system, you know, from jaywalking to speeding to distracted driving, impaired driving, occupant protection, you know, the 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 full gamut of of you know how people use it and using law enforcement to be the enforcers of that. And I submit to you the right ways to do it. And there are also wrong ways to do it uh, when it comes to the behavioral side. But when it comes to the investment side of things, getting a cultural shift amongst transportation planners, um, uh, engineers, um, land use and zoning planners, the idea that how we design our system makes a big difference on the impact to what we call humans, which of course are imperfect beings. And as imperfect beings, we will make mistakes. So how do we build a resilient system that minimizes the negative consequence of our making mistakes using the system. For example, a roundabout is an, uh, an infrastructure improvement that helps with that. And then we have the environmental uh, physical health. And you know, with that, and you know, oftentimes in, in, in our community here, we don't talk about this, but it's really important when you look at the data. And that is you know, things such as air pollution, water pollution, the environmental impact of having a loud roadway near you. Uh, all the things that uh, sometimes get summed up in quality of life, but the impact of this transportation system on your basic health is tremendous. And so there's a lot of conversation, you know, from the EPA on down about that. And, you know, I always find it a little bit ironic when people say that, well, we just want to streamline the permitting process so we can get, you know, more of these roads and highways built. Understand a lot of the permitting process looks at the environmental health which is you know very comprehensive and when you do an environmental assessment and the studies that have to occur it really does require a, a, a lot of engagement with the um, affected communities as well as um, people uh, being able to have input so if we're going to streamline it how do we do so without undercutting the goal of ensuring that the system doesn't harm people more than it does benefit people so anyway, these are the natural breakdowns of all the different organizations that we were able to uh, survey and determine. Um, so when we think about equity, and by the way, this uh, chart here, and I'll give you two charts, it shows uh, the different agencies that we looked at and uh, how it broke down. And what you'll find is um, you know, that a lot of organizations did talk about it but a whole lot of organizations were absolutely silent on the term equity. And I submit to you that, um, especially today or tomorrow, it's really important that uh, organizations take the time to define what they mean by equity. And so um, as we see here by the different organizations, federal agencies, state agencies, NPOs and NGOs, what we find is that um, you, you, you see the, the, the kind of weighting of uh, whether they talk about accessibility, affordability, safety, or physical environmental health. And um, not surprising, uh, obviously, different agencies and organizations are set up to do different things, but this is how the numbers uh, panned out. 
But I think the most important takeaway is that these four different areas in equity and transportation uh, tend to be the common theme um, that either they'll have organizations will have one or more than one of. All right. So what's the takeaway um, with this? And and it's really important, in my opinion, that as I suggested earlier, the, the, the questions are greater than the answers. And, and that is, if you're an organization or if you're a person that is discussing the term equity, it's really important to communicate what you mean by that. Because listeners are gonna have different impressions and ideas as to what they think equity means. And so if you're trying to convey an idea where equity is an important part of it, take the time to say, this is what we mean by equity. You know, we're in the vi environmental area, so this is what we're talking about. We're talking about affordability. No, no, it's access. Or, you know, we're talking about the behavioral side of equity and specifically, for example, how law enforcement should engage the community when it comes to um, enforcing our traffic laws on the roadways. So it's really key for the, the speaker to, to do that. But like everything, um, there's also the other side and that's the listener. Sometimes we'll hear people uh, speak and, you know, kind of say, well, I'm not really understanding what you mean by that. So it's okay because we all come to the table with our biases uh, as humans. And so getting clarity on what uh, the speaker means by equity in context of what's being discussed, I think is a good thing so that everybody can be on the same page when it comes to how we're using the term equity at any given time. And, you know, as, as I mentioned before, there are so many different ways that we use the term. If we have a common understanding when we're communicating with each other, I think we'll get a lot further in achieving our common goals. And um, so that's really what this is about is that uh, in communicating both the speaker and the listener really need to get on that same page uh, as we discuss equity. Now, I think it's important to underscore this throughout. Equity is a very sensitive topic. I mean, we come to the table with our perspective, perspective of what equity is when it's non-existent or when it's been you know, treated with a disservice. And I think it's uh, as speakers and listeners, we just need to be cognizant of that and be very respectful so that when people are articulating something related to equity that we may not understand or some instances we may not agree, but respecting the fact that that person's perspective is their perspective. And so having that conversation in a way that um, recognizes that it's a sensitive term, I think will allow us to be more engaged with each other and achieve uh, you know, better outcomes. Um, and you know, the other component of this is, you know, how do we fix the past or control the future? And you know, as I suggested earlier, um, that perspective does matter because a lot of times you know, the goal is to, to, to fix the past, but I don't know if we can change the past, but certainly we can build off of what we learned as we try to control a better future for all of us. And, so you see that today when decisions are being made about, you know, where roads are being built or, you know, how, you know, things are being done in the enforcement community. You know, it, it really recognizes that in the past we've experienced some things that none of us like. So how do we make our future one that we can all agree is a good thing to uh, achieve? And, you know, with that and, um, you know, we, we, we know this gentleman. Um, uh, Abe Lincoln, uh, sensibly, this is uh, him at the Gettysburg Address. I don't know if that uh, picture has ice in it. It kind of looks like it does, but I'm not sure that they had ice back then at that time uh, for a presentation like that. But during the speech, he talked about uh, a nation of the people, by the people, and for the people. I submit to you there's really a, a fourth one that he probably, if he was taking one more word adding to the Gettysburg Address, those few, couple hundred and something words, and that is this, with the people. Um, I've learned a long time ago from my personal experiences, having been in this arena for now more than 30 years, that when we work with the people, there's really nothing that we cannot accomplish. I mean, it's really incredible when you get down and, and, and have great communication, identify common goals, bring resources to the table, and you know, understand what the data is saying, understanding the best practices, understanding what the impacts are to minimize the negative and maximize the positive of the impacts. Um, success is found with the people, in my opinion, and that is that engagement, the communication uh, with folks. 
And I'll give you some examples. And this is what I refer to as the uh, good and bad and the ugly that I personally have observed or experienced. And um, I'm sure everybody uh, observing this uh, presentation has probably experienced things where they think, you know, if we'd done a little bit differently, it might have turned out better. Or we did it this way, and man, that turned out great. So here's my 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 good, bad, and the ugly. A few years back, uh, GDOT was trying to address some very legitimate uh, traffic concerns in St. Simons, especially during the summer, where they had a couple major routes intersect. And they proposed a roundabout. And the community said, no way, no how. We don't want a roundabout. Those things kill people. I'm from New Jersey. I'm from New York. And I hated them there. You know, I came here to avoid roundabouts, apparently. Well, GDOT, to its credit, said, look, let's do this. We'll put it in. And if it doesn't work and you folks don't like it, we'll take it out. Well, they put it in. People started using it. And kind of like Mikey, he liked it and uh, ended up putting in a second roundabout. And um, with that, um, you see roundabouts going in throughout the, the, the state and people are experiencing and seeing them and, you know, becoming more accepting of them because, you know, folks are willing to have that local engagement. And um, so St. Simons and GDOT, that's a really good example. Um, North Atlanta, I, uh, and this is on Peachtree Road. If you're familiar with Peachtree Road from um, basically 85 North into Buckhead, GDOT came up with a what I thought was a very aggressive really positive, progressive, complete streets plan to um, to give a street diet to Peachtree Road. So instead of six by six lanes, uh, three each way bi-directional, you have two bi-directional lanes, a center turn lane, wide sidewalks, bike lanes, some of which would be protected. Well, the community around there, and by the way, this is really expensive home communities. They came out in droves and said, no way, no how are you going to take our travel lanes from us. We want those six lanes. And so what ended up happening is because that community was not engaged ahead of time is the plan was revised and, and the lanes were kept. Improvements were made, but but not the kind of improvements that could have, I think, have been better um, had the community be engaged ahead of time. They were not. And so the opposition came. Um, another one that um, happened, and this is in South Atlanta, similarly, uh, the city of Atlanta, this, you know, who had been putting in uh, bike lanes and cycle tracks, which is basically a protected uh, bikeway in many parts of the city say, you know, we're gonna to go to an underserved area of the city and put in a cycle track. And lo and behold, the city did it, but they didn't communicate with the citizens around there. And they were furious with that cycle track. Uh, a couple of churches uh, that did lose some parking said, you know what? You may be planting rose bushes in front of our, uh, on our lawn, but don't do so without first asking us. So the city ended up pulling them out because part of the concern that the community had was, you know, we see where these things went up before and they completely regentrified the area like the old fourth ward. We don't want that. So no engagement was done ahead of time. So the money was spent to put it in and the money was spent to take it out. Uh, the Kirkwood capacity building. This um, is something from 1992 when I was co-chair of the DeKalb County Initiative for Family and Children's. And it was an, um, uh, funded by the Metropolitan Organization to identify five communities that were underserved and develop community capacity. So myself and a person named Lois Burns, and Lois was head of um, the DeKalb EOA, which was a Head Start program of DeKalb at the time. We met with community leaders in each of five cities, one of which was Kirkwood, uh, to discuss, you know, how could we develop internally um, citizen involvement and capacity so that better outcomes could occur in those communities. So we're talking about 1992. And I remember um, one of the people that was involved, a fellow named Dr. Brumby, <clears throat> extremely um, smart guy. He uh, was head of uh, pediatrics at Van Eggleston. In fact, one of the buildings is named after him. Sadly, he, he has since died. But at one of the meetings, he said, you know, this is what you all need to do. Boy, that was not the right way to have a conversation because at that point, the people who were from the community and rightfully so said, you know what, nobody's going to come in here, no matter what they're offering and tell us what to do. And they spent a good 30 minutes uh, weighing out, laying out how it was their community. And if people were going to come into the community to assist, they were going to be the, 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 the guide for how that community um, moves forward, not some outsiders. And so that is so right. And so it taught me a long time ago is, how we communicate and how we reach out to people that we do want to help 
really does matter. And so telling people what to do is, 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 is not a good way to start from my experience. So that's, that's in many respects what I, what I call to uh, the, the good, bad, and the ugly. So as you can see there, um, you know, it's not, here's what you need to do. Instead, it's uh, what are our goals and how, how can I help to achieve your goals and can you help achieve my goals? And you know, a lot of times we come to conversations with just wanting to help. Sometimes we, we have ideas, but the recognition that you know, when you're working with a local community as it should be, it's really, you know, in great part, you should, you know, we're there to help. help. And um, so what I like to say is that you communicate before you act, you communicate why you act, and you communicate after you act, <clears throat> and you repeat it. In other words, excuse me, you continue that conversation as an iterative process so that every step of the way, the folks that are involved recognize and, and appreciate that their voices are being heard, they're learning, and they're sharing ideas that are important to them. <clears throat> so in some, I mean, it's just, if we take the time to communicate what we mean by equity, and if we don't understand sharing that with others, then I think that's really important because it is such a dynamic word and it's important and it is affecting all of us in every place that we go as it should. Then, you know, having that good understanding, I think, will uh, get us a long way. Um, identify goals. I mean, you know, as, as, as a listener and speaker, just, you know, lay out some of the goals that uh, are important so that where there's commonality of, of interest and purpose, you know, then some great things can be achieved. So, you know, being, being upfront about that is, I think, always an important thing. <clears throat> and for me, you know, being with, with, with the people, um, I, I just cannot tell you, especially as, as a planning commissioner over the many years now, I've been one since 1996, and, you know, projects will come in, developers will come in, and, and, and you know, folks have seen really good projects and some, seen some awful projects and, you know, affects their, their lives forever, really, when something gets built. So it's just, you know, important that we, we bring folks into the conversation um, early and often. Um, organizations. Um, <clears throat> you need to define what you mean by equity. Do so openly, uh, get a lot of input, you know, engagement. And, you know, by doing that, I think it'll allow organizations to be much more effective in achieving their equitable goals. <clears throat> And so, uh, you know, I submit if you have a website that defines, which most organizations now have, you know, put it up there, you know, let, let folks know this is what we mean by equity. So that as you're having those conversations with others, um, they know that, and, and that to me, that's a good thing. And um, the last point um, is um, it's okay to cheer for the other team. You know, as I said, um, Liz and I are Georgia Tech and Florida grads but we do cheer for Georgia and that's a good thing. Um, but also recognizing that um, we do have our biases and um, you know, others have bias because we're human. I mean, it's just in, in a natural, I guess, condition of being a human. But if we understand that and then share with uh, others what you know, we think and you know, try to understand what others are thinking, especially when it comes to the term equity, I think we'll get a whole lot further so that doesn't become a polarizing term, but it becomes a term that brings us together, which is really what's, I think, at the end of the day intended. And um, so with that, I know that there probably is a whole lot more conversation we can have. And um, that's me. If you ever want to get in touch with me, uh, I'm easy to get in touch with. That's my cell phone number and my email. But um, I'll leave you with this one thought. I, it's actually one of those funny things. <clears throat> Occasionally, I will think of when I became highway safety director, you know, a few months into it, Liz and I were driving somewhere and she was driving actually. And, you know, everybody is a uh, driver. And, and by the way, I think everybody who drives and whoever walks or cycles or engages the system, you, you know, everybody's an expert as much as anybody else. So, so keeping that in mind. But uh, Liz was in the center lane and traffic was passing us on the right. This is 285. Well, you know, I'm highway safety director, you know, so therefore I must be a very important person. So I said, honey, I said, you know, you, you're in the center lane and cars are passing you on the right. 
and that means you're the slower traffic, so you should go into the right lanes <coughs> and let cars pass you on the left. Well, you thought I you know, did the worst thing possible because she didn't speak to me like for a day, you know, that I would have the audacity to uh, have any kind of comment or uh, statement about uh, her driving. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, how we say things and communicate does matter. And there probably would have been a better way for me to have done it uh, because apparently I did do it the wrong way. So it taught me a lot that recognizing that when we have thoughts and ideas, just, just recognizing that, you know, as we share them, how we share them does matter and being sensitive to other people's perspective is, is really key. And uh, it, re it really doesn't come up bigger than, than the term equity because it's used in so many different areas. And I think at the end of the day, you, we all wanna see good equity, you know, the, the, the things that are positive outcomes. So that for me is really coming down to the communication and understanding what we mean by that term. So with that, I will stop sharing and um, more than happy to take on any kind of questions or comments. I see the chat box has a couple comments, so I'll pull that up if that has any questions. Yeah, so those are the um, links to the different uh, in organizations that uh, I referenced during my presentation. But there are a lot of organizations out there that, and, and I think we'll see many more. Uh, and, and I submit to you, every organization should take the time to define how they use equity in context of the work that they do. So with that, uh, Jim and Lila and everybody else on the call, I'm happy to take any questions, comments, suggestions, and uh, just say thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts about equity and transportation. Well, Bob, we appreciate your time as always. And uh, as always, we'll call on you again in the future for more. Uh, <laughs> Folks, if you have some questions, I believe you can unmute yourselves and uh, ask your questions. At least that's what I think it'll do, unless I've blocked everybody. You can you can also raise your hand, and that'll put you in the front and center. I think. Yeah, and certainly any experiences that anybody on the uh, Zoom call have you know had in the years past, you know, I always loved hearing about that. Well, I could tell you quickly about roundabouts. Uh, my wife is from Massachusetts. I'm from New York City. And uh, Massachusetts, they were known as death circles uh, because there was no control. Um, however, now the roundabouts are now scientifically laid out. Uh, in fact, we do a, a the 55 plus driver safety program does a workshop for town planners, municipalities, and traffic engineers on um, what are the best road designs for aging drivers, larger fonts for street signs, roundabouts, uh, right. diverse uh, diamonds or- Diverging diamonds. Diverging diamonds. And right. you know all these little things that help not just an aging driver, but it helps the entire population of um, drivers. And um, it, it, it always amazed me because before the roundabouts were put in, there was some fatal crashes. And but very few accidents. When the roundabouts went in, crashes went up, but fatalities disappeared. Right. So it was a nice, um, nice balance between the cost of a bumper versus the cost of losing somebody. Right. And, you know, roundabouts is, is in the, in the bias that, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not picking on people from the Northeast, but the bias that they bring because they had the traditional roundabout. That's why we call them modern roundabouts because they're designed differently. And that's an important context for, point to remember. They're, uh, they're not the same thing. But no. having said that, uh, what was it? Roswell, the city of Roswell put in a roundabout at an intersection where three major roads came together. It was a very difficult intersection. And boy, it had so much opposition going in by the people who lived next to it. And I went to the ribbon cutting for it. And just to be an observer, the two of the main speakers were those same people who were so opposed to it. And before the ribbon cutting, it was in for a couple months. They said, you know, at first we were opponents of it, but now that we've used it and seen the aesthetics of it, they became advocates for it. Bob, I have a question. I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here, but can you talk a little bit about how, if you're going to, <clears throat> if you're going to try to achieve equity, you have to be aware of what the inequities are. In other words, there you have to have some information going on. Yeah, so I'll give from a Vision Zero perspective, when we discuss equity, 
front and center with that conversation is data, looking at the past. And, you know, decisions about things that we support have got to be based on, on data. Now, don't get me wrong, that's not enough. But you, it is important in the transportation arena to, to have a very good understanding of the past. Um, I'll give you an interesting one. In the city of Atlanta, only because obviously it's our biggest city, they uh, made the decision in the downtown core area to take their one-way streets and make them bi-directional, uh, many of them. And you know the question is, well, why would you do that? Well, I understand they were put in there at, as one-way street. They were first put in as bi-directional streets and they became one-way streets. They were put in as one-way streets to facilitate the suburban exodus from the city of Atlanta. And you know the idea that we're gonna help the suburban driver get home further on this new interstate, interstate infrastructure for the suburbs that everybody's paying for, by the way. And it came at the expense of the urban core, but it was facilitated by that. And so as the city of Atlanta said, okay, we're gonna change our one-way streets that have been there for decades to bi-directional streets. It was, you had a whole lot of folks saying, oh no, that's a bad idea. We, we like these one-way streets who lived in the city of Atlanta and, you know, and both the, you know, um, gentrified areas, the, 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 the areas that have been underserved and the work should have gone on to have that conversation with everybody about why, why they were made one way to begin with. And, you know, that, that to me is a, is, is a front and center example of understanding the, 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 the past. Another one, and we'll use the behavioral one. So in highway safety, uh, from the governor's office of highway safety to GHSA and NHTSA, it, these are behavioral organizations. They look at how we drive with the existing infrastructure. We rely heavily, heavily on law enforcement to do that. <clears throat> well, if you're doing that, then the question is gonna come up because of what we have seen these past couple of years for profiling, <clears throat> how are you gonna affect positive change with that when you have a community that says we should not be stopping cars with people with guns and you know the only way to, to, to get to the point that you can affect behavioral changes with law enforcement in a way that a community accepts it you have to reach out to the community and talk about the data as to where the serious injuries and deaths are occurring talk about the data where you have you know either excessive speeding or other behavioral attributes that make it unsafe for people so they don't use it from a pedestrian or cycling perspective and talk about the folks with the folks about you know how you do anything and, 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 and it's called high visibility enforcement in other words you're engaging the community before you do anything and and it but you can't know where to go and how to do things if you don't have your good data to support it so Data is, is, is a key tool to allowing any equity conversation to move forward because that helps us to you know, better understand our past because data is retrospective in order to develop you know, best practices to improve the future. But the community has got to have an input on that. And if, let me just say this, if, if we take, for example, I call it an experiment that was very unintentional. Uh, so we had a pandemic, we're in it still. Uh, came about last year and the and the um, shutdown occurred where we all had to shelter in place for you know whenever that started and we were all amazed at no traffic on the roadways right uh -oh. you hear my crazy dog in the background um no no traffic on the roadways yet what we saw last year was our crash deaths went up think about that our miles driven went way down and our crash deaths went up my goodness, our crash death rate is going through the roof. And it's being, again, well, why is that? Well, with less cars on the road, people took advantage of it with excessive speed. We think they were also uh, driving distracted. And so we had more serious injuries and deaths on the roadways than before when we had more people on the roadways. The, and, other, thing, the other thing that also happened uh, in 2008 with the economic crisis, we saw the same pattern. Mileage went down, crash rate went up. And uh, one of NHTSA's theories about that was you had to look at who stopped driving and who kept driving. And then in many cases, it was the higher risk drivers were reducing their driving less. 
Well, that, and, and that's, that's, that's part of it too. And, but I, I will submit to you also, when we look at the uh, law enforcement community this past year, <clears throat> for two reasons, um, they were not out in force uh, and it had an impact. One, um, how do you engage the, you know, the vehicle when it stopped? Because you don't know how the pandemic's being, you know, uh, trans uh, transmitted at that time. And secondly, you know, the, the, the effect of a national conversation that we had not had like we had before on using um, uh, traffic stops that turned into profiling, right? That became a conversation. So law enforcement, you know, they pulled back quite a bit. Well, I mean, that ha that, that was an experiment that happened, right? So you, 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 nobody in their right mind is going to have it, you know, as, as you're uh, hey, hey, I want to do the experiment. First, let's get us a pandemic and see what happens to stop traffic. Nobody's going to do that. But this is what happened. And I think that, you know, good folks like Shanae, who I can see is on the call as epidemiologists, will look back at this and give us some really good data analysis to assess what the impacts were by these changes. So by understanding that, we can develop much better strategies for the future, because now we have something that we didn't see before. So we had information from the Great Recession. We certainly have a lot of information from the uh, pandemic, which is being studied as we speak. The best thing that can happen from that, you know, in some respects, is that we use that data to our benefit in the future. Because I'll say this from a Vision Zero perspective, and we have a lot of conversations about how law enforcement, you know, should work. I mean, there's some who say none. There are others that, and I, I will put myself in this category, it should be done right. High visibility enforcement, you know, engaging the community, using your data, um, you know, not tail lights, but serious things such as impaired driving, you know, things like that. But um, the, the, where I was going with this, the, the idea that we, we develop, um, you know, behavioral strategies uh, is great, but our goal at Vision Zero is really to develop an infrastructure that relies less on our behavior. And we say that because we all suffer from this condition of being human. Humans make mistakes when they drive, when they walk, when they ride, uh, cycle, everything that they do, we all make mistakes. And our goal is that the consequence of those mistakes should not be a serious injury or death. And we don't, you know, we're not speaking, you know, fantasy land here. We have seen specific examples in other parts of the country, but in other parts of the world, where if the investment decisions are made to change how our infrastructure works, we can substantially, if not eliminate, crash tests. Yeah, and if there's one place that you need data, uh, the Georgia Department of Public Health has vast storage of data. Right. Just have to find the right person to ask in this group. If you need some some information or some background data, you can contact um, Lila or I. I'll put my um, email in the in the chat. You can also save the chat. I believe you should have permission to um, save the chat on your own, so you don't have to copy all those links. Um, we will be saving the chat, and sending it out, making a recording. All right. Well, any other um, questions or comments? I know Shanae made a comment about the um, the bridge, the Jimmy Carter uh, bridge. Um, yeah, being a, being a newbie down here for a uh, time, I came across that bridge and I, I'm on the wrong side of the road and I panicked and didn't know what to do. And I'm supposedly uh, a professional in driving safety. Um, well, let me give you some history on that bridge. These are the divergent diamond interchanges. <laughs> yeah, that actually was invented in France. And uh, Missouri, I believe, a guy named Pete Ron was the, uh, their commissioner over the DOT, uh, implemented it there. And what they saw was a substantial improvement in the um, throughput, as well as actually surprisingly improving safety, primarily because people had to slow down. And um, so I first saw that when I was highway safety director and I spoke with Keith Golden, and we would go to meetings together that dealt with common interests. I said, Keith, you gotta look at this stuff. It's a, it's a strange bridge up there. Um, and GDOT to its credit, you know, it's all on them at that point. Um, Ashford Nobody over 285 was the first one in Georgia. 
And then we've seen them again and again and again because they're very efficient ways to move traffic and have the potential to improve safety. But, but there are debates over these things. Uh, nothing's perfect. How do you move pedestrians and cyclists through a divergent diamond interchange? And there's a lot of debate over that. You know, some say, oh, you put them in the center and make them cross over four times, four different uh, places. Or for cyclists, anyway, do you, do you build a, a, a bike lane that keeps them into the flow of traffic? So anyway, there's still a lot of debate over that from a uh, vulnerable road user perspective, but they, they do improve the flow and I think the safety as well. Oh, I think they, they do. But um, one of the things that you touched on in your presentation is communication. Um, you know, where the last time, say for an aging driver, the last time they had any driver training was back when they were 16. And that was way before, you know, a lot of the, um, the safety factors that are in the car. But where do you get the training? How do you tell people that this is how you handle that um, uh, situation? How do you handle that new design? Well, I, I, I'll give you an experience that I served on a mortarboard for four years. And you know, I was chair of PEDS and, you know, from a PEDS perspective, we looked at corridors and data. The number of pedestrian serious injuries and deaths near transit stops, you know, bus stops and things like that are, are, are just up there. And now here I am serving on a monitor board and I say, well, what are we doing to locate these bus stops from a safety perspective? And, and, and the answer was it was assumed that that was being looked at. I said, you can't assume any of this. You know, the decision about when you do something like this has to, at first and foremost, and throughout the whole process, and engage the local community, has to look at um, the safety impact. So when you put a mid-block bus stop that has business on one side and maybe a large apartment complex or community on the other side, and you don't put any infrastructure as a pedestrian across it, and it's, a, it's like Cobb Parkway has, you know, three or six or eight lanes of bi-directional traffic traveling at a minimum 45 miles an hour. And you have nothing to uh, you know, help the pedestrian who's being put off mid-block and you know they're gonna cross the street. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a recipe for disaster. Where is that conversation? Well, you know, we've got different jurisdictions, this, that, and the other, and it costs a lot of money. I said, well, how much is a life worth? And, you know, I don't say this out of turn because we know what the pedestrian death data is in Georgia. Right. It's gone up, you know, over the past several years for a host of reasons. And obviously the pandemic may have affected it. I, I don't know that or not. But these decisions, when they're being made, have got to put, you know, that, what our safety infrastructure looks like. And it cannot be done the way we learned about it in 1970. So, Lila, I see you have your hand up right there. So, yeah, uh, another, uh, I think one example that everybody in here probably can identify with of that somebody else's problem uh, phenomenon is think about the last time you got out of your car in a parking deck and tried to figure out how to walk out to the nearest exit without getting run over. Because the people who design parking decks design them for cars, not for pedestrians. No. And, and the irony is, of course, whatever your mode of transportation, you know, becomes, you, you, at some point you're going to be a pedestrian. You know, whether, you, you know, you're, you're, you know, at some point you will you you will not be in a vehicle. No, it, it, it it's it's just amazing. Um, but I think the idea though that a lot of organizations and and, and I, I credit GDOT uh, a lot because if you look back twenty years ago, GDOT's perspective was one thing. Today is so much more advanced. And the group in the safety operations division, they come out with some really good ideas and they look at all the projects. And and as I mentioned, that example on Peachtree Road from 85 into Buckhead, that was a GDOT initiated plan. The problem was that we didn't have the partnerships necessary to meet with the community ahead of time and engage them and talk about things and make changes that, that really reflected the values of the community as opposed to, we don't want it, you know, change it. You know, it's just like became intransigent. And at that point, you don't have the conversation so you don't get good outcome. Yeah, uh, GDOT has done a lot of innovative um, ideas. They're they're much more open now, and I'm taking a lot. And uh, working with them is is a pleasure. Um, oh yeah, as opposed to some other states. Yep. No, that's um, well. You and you've heard this conversation. There's uh, I forget the author's name. Really bright individual that 
says, you know, we have to de design our systems from, so people from eight to 80 can use them. They're basically saying the youngest and the oldest of us, if you design for them, then everything in the middle will probably benefit for that. It'll fall right in. Well, Bob, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Um, I think you well. guys enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to do a quick advertisement here for the 55 plus driver safety program, just to give you an idea of what we do here in Georgia. We have a couple of programs. One is called Yellow Dot. Yellow Dot is a way that um, law enforcement and first responders and our EMS folks, if uh, an aged driver or a vulnerable population person is involved in a crash, uh, they would look in the glove box for a little yellow packet, and it has all the medical information of those folks in the car. Um, it helps out through that golden hour when EMS shows up. It gives them the information that they have. We are trying to spread that throughout the state. We also do car fit. Car fit is where you come in and we um, help you fit yourself to your car. Um, how your headrest should be. Where, what's the best way to set up your um, side view and rear view mirrors? And just basically get a fit for it. We also, um, as I mentioned before, we do a um, workshop for town planners. Uh, traffic engineers and um, look at different areas that can help aging drivers drive longer and safer when they're out there. And that's two, um, and that one's coming up actually next week on the 23rd. If you're interested, send me an email and I will send you the invite so that you can register for that program. It is open for everyone, not just engineers. But if you want to get an idea about what um, Bob and I were talking about, about the divergent diamonds, roundabouts, and the science behind them, this is an excellent, excellent um, workshop done by the um, Federal Highway Administration, their research division. Um, we also uh, have a 55 plus driver safety task team. We are affiliated with the Governor's Office of Highway Safety, which is where I first met Bob. Um, and uh, we have our task team for the aging driver and you're all invited to take part. We are looking to increase that and use your skills to better reach uh, more of our population within the state and different areas. So with that, Lyler, would you like to add anything? No, I think you've covered it and we're right at our time. Good, because that's why I asked Lila to make sure I did cover everything. <laughs> Bob, again, thank you so much. We appreciate it as always, a great job and getting that information out there. And everyone else, thank you so much for attending. Hopefully you can come up to one of our other um, quick pop-up symposiums. But for now, thank you so much and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.